Hey everyone, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Minded Podcast. If you know or you don't know, I am a very, very coffee lover. Today we have a guest that's one of the co-founders, co-owners of a very popular local coffee shop here in Santa Cruz. You do not want to miss out on this episode. It's filled with very interesting things that we go and talk about. So sit back and enjoy the episode. Thank you. So, Chris, oh wel- my wel- gosh, welcome to uh, the podcast. What up, Minded Podcast? Um, Thank you. How you doing? I'm pretty good. Hell yeah, man! Yeah. Pleasure, pleasure, and honor having you here. Every dude. day is a new adventure. Hell yeah, man! Um, it's funny, it's funny how we met, or it's funny how I met you because uh, the week before you came into the shop, I was actually watching that video with uh, Matt Devella. Right, and um, I see you walking in. I was like, where have I seen this guy before? He looks so familiar. At first, I thought you were a pro skater because you you dress like a um, pro skater. So yeah. I was like, "Is he a skater?" And then I was like, "Nah, I don't know." And I felt kind of awkward telling you, uh, "Hey, I, uh, I think you were in the Matt Devella's video." So then I slowly kind of like snuck in the question in there. You're like, "Yeah, I'm on this video." Yeah, you're like, "You're wearing that same hat, right?" Yeah, you, I was yeah, like, "Yeah, for sure." That's so crazy, dude. Um, have you kept up with them? Have you like yeah. kept in touch with them? Yeah, we text every once in oh, a yeah? while. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll send them some things that I'm working on. Oh yeah, that's that's pretty sick, man. Like, how how did you contact him again, or what was the story behind how you got on his video? So Alex, who works with us, he runs our wholesale partner program when okay. we sell coffee to other people. So I own a coffee roasting company. Um, he's really in to minimalism. He's got this plan to live in a tiny home and all this stuff. Okay. And I was kind of chatting with him about it, and he was like, "Dude, you make videos. You, you ever seen uh, the, the minimalism documentary?" I was like, "No, nah, I never seen the minimalism documentary." So he's like, "The dude that made it has a YouTube channel and makes like all this awesome stuff." And it was Matt. So he turns me on to Matt's stuff. So I just, you know, do what you do when you find something new. Is like you go full bore. So I'm just like up all night watching all these videos. And he's a super talented filmmaker. Obviously, his stuff is is perfect you can tell he's got an amazing film background really good at breaking stuff down so i was just pumped i was like damn this dude's tight and there was this theme of him making coffee in his videos so i was just like i want to send him coffee like he got it he's got to drink some of our coffee just because the vibe is right so he had this little contact form on his website that says you know i don't respond to email a lot I'm, I'm really busy i spend most of my time making stuff but if you want to reach out just record a little snippet, send it to this email, and you know maybe I'll get to it, maybe I won't. So I'm immediately thinking, what's going to give me the best chance of being able to actually send this dude coffee? So I was like, I got to make it fun, I got to make it engaging, and, and as clean as possible. So I took out the podcast gear that we have, and I just recorded this little snippet of me talking in my room, and I was like, dude, I have just got introduced to your work, it's fucking amazing. Like, thank you so much for what you do. I see you drinking coffee. I want to send you coffee, you know, no strings attached. Like I'm not trying to get it featured on the channel or have you plug it. Cause I'm sure people like that, you know, he's got millions of subscribers on his YouTube channel. People probably hit him up all the time. Like, do you want to do a collab with this? Or do you want to, you know, feature this or whatever? And I didn't want it to be like that. Just like good vibes, enjoy it by yourself, you know? And he hit me back and he was like, dude, I'd love to try some of your coffee. So I sent him the coffee and then just hit him up a little bit after that. I was like, hey, we're going to be in LA. We have this podcast. Would you be down to come and talk on our podcast? We talk about business, you know, um, the journey of kind of like being a little bit better every day than you were the day before. And, and you're in this zone with what you do. I think it'd be really great. And he was super down. He's like, fuck yeah, let's do it would you be down to come on the ground up show, which is his podcast? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So it just started there. It oh, was just, so you guys connected back and forth with each other. Yeah. Podcast? Oh, shit, yeah. That's cool. So it was just like a cool, cool little reach out. So I went over to his house to record his podcast, kind of in a setup, exactly like what we have going on here. You know, he, he records it at his house, right? I yeah, yeah, he okay. did. He's since moved to a different house. So I don't know what his setup was like now, but it was a trip. Cause you see, you see people and where they operate with like on YouTube. So like even people who might be watching this right now, yeah. you know, they have this like snapshot in their mind of like what the studio must look like. Exactly. So you get there and you roll in and it's just his kitchen. You know, I'm like, wow, it's way smaller than it looks like on video. And it's just so different and interesting. And when you guys interacted, it was all before um, he came out with that video, right? Before the coffee video. Yes. And then he had that idea of um, 
of quitting coffee for what was it 30 days yeah and then he he hit you up right he's like yes or how did that go down yeah so same thing he had that idea for a while so when we first met he had had the idea of doing all these different 30-day challenges which was kind of like the theme for his channel for probably probably close to the past year or so and he's all at some point i'm gonna go and do 30 days with no coffee if you're down to do it with me that'd be tight and it'd be fun to come to santa cruz and film some coffee roasting get a little bit of coffee information he does a real good job of taking whatever his challenge might be and connecting it to like a greater cause so you know it's cool you can make a video about quitting coffee for 30 days, but in that video, you get a little bit of roasting information, you get a little bit of brewing information, like a taste of the culture that you're participating in, which is cool. That's, that's so crazy. So I was like, yeah, come on, let's do it. Yeah, I saw that video, but I don't I don't think I was paying quite attention, but when yeah, I, I remember when he brought you on, I, I didn't pay attention to the fact that he was actually in Santa Cruz, so I was like, that's weird, you know? But now that I look back at it, I'm like, oh shit, that he was talking about Can Cloud and, and the whole, you guys brew your coffee too, right, at the... Or what do you guys do with um, roast it, right? You guys roast yep. your coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, how, 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 what's the process behind roasting that? Or how does it work? Or Yeah, roasting's crazy. So coffee, coffee's a trip. Have you, have you ever seen green coffee, like I, unroasted I haven't, coffee? I haven't, I haven't. Okay, so the, the spiel with coffee is that coffee, when it grows on the plant, it's a, coffee's a fruit. So okay. it looks like a little cherry, like you'd okay. call it a coffee cherry. And then the bean part is actually like the seed or the pit of that fruit. So if you imagine like a cherry and that was your that was your coffee, you like you peel away the red outer skin and then that fleshy fruit part, and then you're left with generally two two little coffee seeds or two little coffee beans. And they're green before they they're turn. They're green, oh, yeah. Shit. Before they're roasted, it's just a green seed. So when we buy coffee, it comes in those big 150-pound jute bags, which is full of green coffee. And Roasting is basically the process of unlocking whatever magic is already inside that coffee. So it's just like any other agricultural product. There's like all different kinds, all different varieties, all different. They all have their own, you know, different taste characteristics. Just like you think about like an apple or a peach. There's like a bunch of different kinds of apples. You know, you got Granny Smith, you got Golden Delicious, you got all these all these weird different things and that's how coffee is um varieties growing regions all that stuff so you get in like basically already green and then you yeah. you go through the process of roasting and that's roasting. how it becomes brown like, brown yeah that's crazy that's yeah. crazy um so what i wanted to ask you was what's what was like okay like you know a lot of people i don't know how many times you've shared your um background story or like the, your come up right? yeah um but uh, I don't think I've asked you that yet, but, like, I would love love to know, like, what was the whole process of, like, that led you into this whole entrepreneurship oh, life, yeah. this whole, like, what were you doing before you, like, snap and you're like, oh, shit, I want to have my own business. I want to do this. I want to do that. Yeah. At what point in your life where you're like, okay, I had enough of what I'm doing and I want to kind of do more? Yeah. I never wanted to have my own business. It's... You I, it was, like, never on my mind. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to do... I never wanted to do any of this. All I ever wanted to do was go to work, have a good time, work really hard and feel like my work was contributing to something that was bigger than myself. And then within that little world, I've always been kind of a creative dude. So it's important for me to have freedom to experiment and, and try different things out. Um, I got involved in the coffee world just kind of by accident and got got sucked in by this whole whole idea of espresso culture which at the time was like really really brand new and it's still kind of growing you know if you think back 10 years or 15 years the the idea of specialty coffee being what it is now it just didn't exist like when i was a kid it's not like people were going down to the cafe and drinking cappuccinos it was like you know coffee was something that you made at home you just drink it. It was just like a functional beverage. You know, it, it gives you caffeine and, and it's no big deal. And all these high end specialty places just kind of slowly started popping up. And I just thought it was cool. Like to be on the front end of any new industry that's emerging, it just seemed rad. And I was just in love with coffee. So I remember the day, the first part of the whole thing was I called my mom and I was like, Mom, I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to go to college anymore. I'm out of here. And I had all I had left to do was my senior thesis. 
and I would have been done. Oh, man. And I was on the path to becoming a teacher. I was going to be a history teacher. Okay. So I was a history major. That was, that was my jam. I was like, I'm out. I'm moving to San Francisco. I'm going to go work at this coffee company that's like on the cutting edge. And it was this place called Ritual. And she's like, you're, you're nuts. You're insane. What are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just going to figure it out. Um, so in, I keep looking at the camera. I'm not supposed to look at you. What? <laughs> you can edit this out, right? It's not a big deal. Or keep it in. It'll be funny. No, that's funny. Um, <laughs> Through working in coffee and starting that, I, you know, coming from that background of I was going to be a teacher, I found that I really had a knack for education. So after I started going, I was like, oh, I really enjoy sharing things with people, teaching people, got heavy into teaching people about coffee, teaching people about espresso, doing quality control. And I had a really good time. And the only reason I left San Francisco was I just needed a change, like a little change of pace, change in my life. And that was how I ended up coming to Santa Cruz. Same thing, started working for a coffee company in Santa Cruz. So I worked for Verve for a long time. Okay. Jared, my business partner who you met earlier, yeah. he was the first employee there ever. Oh, damn, that's crazy. Yeah, and we'd become friends over the years, and I was telling him about you know life and all that. He's like, you should just come to Santa Cruz. Come check it out. How'd see you, what's how'd up. you meet uh, Jared, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, we met at a barista competition. Oh, so, they, oh damn. Yeah, your response is perfect. So there's, <laughs> this, there's this whole weird world of barista competitions, roasting competitions. So in a couple months, it's in Portland this year, but every year there's the annual Specialty Coffee Association of America annual conference. And at that conference, there's a big trade show where you see new product roasters come and have booths. There's like, there's like new packaging, different importers, exporters, everyone's there. And then another part of the show, are the competitions. So there's barista competitions, uh, cup tasters competitions, roasting competition. And the barista competition is like the ultimate dog and pony show. It's it's banana. So it kind of works like this. You bring everything with you come and there's like a there's a station set up for you. It's kind of like the iron chef of coffee. All that's there is an espresso machine. You bring everything else you're gonna use. So you bring like table setting, water glasses, the coffee that you're gonna use, like the whole kit, you wheel it out on a cart, you set it all up. And then you do a three course service to four different judges. So there's four different judges in front of you and you're serving them and you're telling them about your coffee, usually some story. Um, you're kind of part of its taste and tactile and proficiency. And then there's this other part of it where you're trying to create this magical connection between what you're serving them and what they're experiencing, right? They're drinking coffee all day. So why should they pay attention to this coffee that you have? Um, and then there's two other judges that are hovering around you, judging you on your technical proficiency, how much you're wasting, like your station management, this whole thing. It's insane. It's bananas. It's the next level. So back in like 2005, 2006, I caught wind of this whole world and I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try this out. I'm going to go to one of these competitions. I'm going to make it happen. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like, we're just going to go for it. So I get as much ready as I can, and I show up. And this was a regional competition. It was up north in Petaluma. And all of a sudden, I'm in this world where I don't know anybody. Everybody else knows each other. Everyone's homies. They've been doing this forever. And I was just like, oh, shit. What did I get myself into? Jared was there. And he was in the same boat that I was in to where it was his first competition. He... Uh, had also just found out about this weird, crazy world and wanted to dive in. So we kind of find, found each other there, and we happened to share the same practice station that you use like before you go on. And we were sharing it with the girl at the time who was the United States barista champion. Like everybody in the game knew who she was. And we were just looking at each other like, what is going on? Like what's happening? And she was so confident and straight up, and we were just like, I don't know what to do. Um, so that was where we met, and then we just kind of stayed in touch over the years. But we didn't work together for you know four or five years after that. So he he's originally from Santa Cruz. He's he, he, or he's from Chico. Oh, Chico. Okay. And then moved to Santa Cruz when they were opening up Verve. And Verve originated in Santa Cruz too, right? Or yeah. So one of the dudes who started Verve was from Chico. Okay. And he had a cafe. He bought a cafe in Chico, and okay. Jared was working at that cafe. So he inherited Jared as an employee. Okay. And that cafe was going, and he was new to the game too, and he was like, oh, this is interesting. 
we have this idea to open up a cafe in Santa Cruz. And Jared's like, I want to go. So he moved down with him to kind of help start that. And then once he moved down there, he kind of, you had already contact with him. He was like, hey, we have this new coffee shop. You trying to come or what? Yeah. So we, I was in San Francisco at the time and they would come and visit because the place that I worked at was kind of like a hub for people doing what you might call specialty coffee tourism. It was a place where people would go. They were really ahead of the game. So it was kind of like the model of what you could do in this new era of coffee. So they were in the city all the time. They'd be going to shows or go to check out other stuff and come in and get coffee. So I got to know them all through that. So when I was trying to flip it up a little bit, he was like, dude, just come down. We'll figure it out. I don't know what you'll do, but you could do something. So I did. I was just like, cool, I'm coming. Damn, that's crazy. Like, it's crazy to see how big, like, the coffee scene has evolved. Because I, I know me, I haven't, I've never knew there was a world of coffee out there, you know? Like, uh, I recently got into coffee as soon as I came out here to Santa Cruz, too. I'm like, yeah. uh, you know, I never went to, the only coffee shop I knew was, like, Starbucks, you know? Right. Like, and then once you come out here, you start trying all these coffee shops and you're like oh damn like what like starbucks is like watered down coffee you know and you start trying all these new coffee shops and you're like damn the culture over here is really like they take it seriously you know it's not just another, pretty crazy yeah it's just not another cup of coffee you know and it's just i don't know i think it's it's, it's crazy what this whole industry is and what it's becoming you know yeah and it's just damn i don't know so what what was what was the story like? So you were at Verb for how long? Would you say? Uh, probably five years. Five years, somewhere in there. And when, at first, it was great, and I got to do a lot of the things that I was really, really passionate about. And at the time, I was like, "Cool, I'll work here forever. This feels nice. I, I can get down." You know, we were kind of a small operation when I first started. There it was just one store, so it was a lot different than what it is now. Um, I was there through some of the growth, but. Eventually, what ended up happening was all of these things that were special to me, all of these things that I needed, they kind of checked off the boxes of workplace satisfaction, started to disappear like one after another, after another, after another, to where I kind of got to a place where I didn't really have a ton of creative freedom. I didn't feel like coming to work was contributing to anything bigger, and I felt really disconnected from the reason I came here. And I was just like really bummed about it and didn't know what to do. Like the, it should have been a quote unquote, like really good job. Like I got paid pretty well. Um, it wasn't incredibly, it was, you make everything as challenging as you want it to be, but it wasn't like, you know, a ton of sweat equity work. It wasn't like, I was just like, Oh my God, I'm fucking busting my ass, like dying over here, like physical labor kind of stuff or anything like that. But there was just a drift in the culture of the company, and there was a drift in the culture of what I wanted out of a workplace experience, and the gap was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the same thing was happening for Jared. And, there, you know, there's a bunch of different little stories that that lead up to these things. And um, how to tell one. So we always, we're we're crazy, right? Jared and I are weird. We're nuts. We always have all these weird, weird ideas for how the world could be a better place. And we're not incredibly shy about sharing those ideas. So I remember one meeting where we pitched to the owners. I was like, we got some ideas about how to make cafe experience as amazing as it could be. We had this whole kind of total package brainstorm about education, guest service, and somewhat the structure of the company. At the time, I was working in trading and education, and he was kind of managing a cafe. So we didn't really work. We worked the same company, but we didn't work together on the day-to-day. So we pitched this idea, and they listened to us, and then they were like, no, you can't do it. And we're like, why? And they said, we don't think you guys should work together. Like, one of you guys is going to have to be in charge, and the other one's not going to like that. Jared's pretty chill, so he's like, nah, if we need a boss, like, Chris can be the the boss, whatever you want to call that. Yeah. It, it'll be fine. You know, someone's a decision maker. They're like, no, you, you guys can't. It's going to be it's gonna be bad. No chance. Like, you'll thank us later, but you can't do this. And we're like, all right, which I don't expect to get every idea that I pitch picked up. Yeah. Like, I get that there's a direction to certain businesses and – um. You have to respect what the company needs. It's not all about what you want. It's like, how can you bring value to the organization? 
But I was like, dang, I know that when we work together, something magical happens. So not being allowed to work together seemed like a, I don't know. It was just kind of a bummer. And it was like that comboed many, many times over. Like at one point I ended up working in the marketing department and we didn't really have a marketing vision. This was kind of at the time where the Santa Cruz expansion had happened and we were starting to kind of go into the Los Angeles market. Okay. And there's one other person in the marketing department and they're like, you need to change. You can go here. We don't know what we need. And I'm like, all right, cool. What can I do? What can I do? I don't know. How can, how can I help? So I'd always made skate videos when I was a kid, like film everything, just make these weird edits, make weird skits. So I felt pretty comfortable with like the basics of video equipment. And again, drawing back on that teaching background, I was like watching, I was watching coffee brewing tutorials one day and I was like, all of these are fucking terrible. They're just way longer than they need to be, like way more intense than they need to be. They're not concise. They're more confusing than helpful. So I was like, I'm going to make a bunch of coffee brewing tutorials. So I pitched that idea and they're like, cool, yeah, you could do it. I'm like, sick, here's what I need. And it was like really basic, like a basic DSLR, one lens, like a mic on camera, nothing crazy. And one of the owners at the time, he was like a huge audiophile. He's like, cool, we can do it, but we got to get all this other stuff too. And he's like, at the, like the most crazy preamps and like insane like Sennheiser mics and then like you know, thousands of dollars on Zeiss glass and all this other stuff and I'm just thinking like you know I'll run like a ADD and use yeah. like a nifty 50 you know we'll make it work so we get all this this crazy equipment most of which I don't know how to use and I was like I don't know how to use this stuff just letting you know I'm comfortable with this other stuff over here they bought it anyway so I just start making these brewing tutorials, start making these videos, make, I'm churning them out, you know, kind of doing like a clip of one a week, shoot, edit, produce the whole thing myself, and we start putting them out. And one day, one of the, one of the owners is like, hey, you got a second? And I was like, yeah, totally, what's up? And he brings me outside and he's just like, don't take this the wrong way. And like any time a conversation starts with that, you know, you're fucked it's yeah. like it's not gonna go well he's like we spent all this money on stuff to make videos and you're making these videos and they're not very good and i'm like cool what should i do and he's like i don't know they're just not very good i'm like down with that i don't know how to use all that stuff that we spent the money on and i'm not a professional i'm just someone who's trying it out so what do I do? Like, how do I make it better? And he's just like, yeah, they're just not, they're just not very good. So I was like, okay, cool. Which again, feedback and critique is part of the whole game, right? Yeah. You put yourself out there, you, you make some adjustments and you tweak and you go from there. But to be standing out there, having the owner of a company tell you that what you're making is not very good when you're trying as hard as you possibly can, doing everything you can for the organization and offering no guidance as to, you know, I just want one little nugget, right? Like yeah. one little thing is like, how do I just start to make it better? What is your expectation? Cause I'm a hard charger. Like if you give me a challenge, I'll fully, I'll fully get down and we'll yeah. try to get somewhere with it. And none of that was happening. So I was just standing there after the conversation and I remember feeling how I felt and feeling, thinking that like nobody should ever feel like this at work. Like I don't want to feel like this again and I don't think anybody else should ever have to feel like that. And I think that was, again, there's like a bunch of different stories like yeah. that, but in those moments I was starting to realize that damn, I was kind of planning on being here forever, but I don't think I can be because this isn't right. And Jared was having some similar experiences. So that was really what led to the jump off is feeling this kind of weird sense of pain and also empathy for people that we worked with. And like, I think a lot of people can relate. Like everyone's had a shitty job. Everyone knows what it feels like to get up and go to work for someone who just doesn't care. Um, and I don't think they're all, I don't think they're bad people. Like now, you know, looking at it from where I am now, owning a business is super complex. You know, every day is different. Like 
I'm not a professional at business. Like me and Jared and Charles, who's our other partner, we're not, you know, we didn't go to school for this. We don't have a ton of like in real life mentors. We're trying to learn as much as we can from wherever we can all the time. So imperfection is part of the game. And I, I don't think that people who aren't doing right by their employees, I don't think that they're bad people. I think a lot of them are probably just overwhelmed. They have their own pressures and stresses leaning in on them. And it's challenging when things are hard for you to take a moment, disconnect, and think about how are my people feeling? What, what are people thinking when they come to work every day? How is that impacting where we're going to go? And that's what Cat and Cloud, our business, is built on. It's like seeing things from other people's eyes. And that manifests in how we try to treat the people that work for us, like remembering what it felt like to be that employee who got smacked down, remembering what it feels like to come to work and not have anyone care. And even in the cafe or when we sell coffee to other people, like looking at things from the guest perspective, you know, you're behind the counter, you're in a guest service job. It's not about you. It's about the people that are coming in. How are they feeling? Like leaning into like, what, what day is, what kind of day are they having, you know? And getting away from those generic kind of guest service interactions. And just, you know, you might come in one day and you're looking pretty pumped and they're like, Oh, cool. Ed's here. He's looking, he's looking amped. Like we're, we're gonna have a little conversation, chat with Ed, say what's up. You might come in another day and just look kind of gloom and doom, feel kind of funky. And someone who's in their zone will be like, Ed's maybe having a bad day. He maybe doesn't want to talk. Maybe coming at him super hard isn't the right way. Be like, hey, dude, what's going on? Here's your coffee. You know, a, you might be more primed for like a gentle interaction yeah. that day. And then the same thing with wholesale, selling other people coffee. Like, fuck, people can buy coffee anywhere. There's no shortage of being able to buy coffee. If you want to open a specialty coffee shop, you've got roasters galore to choose from. So we're really focusing on... We know how to roast coffee well. You know, we've been in the game for, for years. The coffee, there's intentionality behind it, but really we're looking at what can we add to your business? Because we know that challenge. And most of the people that we sell coffee to are one owner shops where everything falls on the shoulder of one person. And taking the time out to, you know, help people get their business plan together, help people wade through the challenges of opening up a new business. Like we're fortunate. There's three of us and then we have some employee owners. So there's pressure relieved in a bunch of different ways. But honestly, everything we do as an organization is how, how can we help and not have people feel that way? Yeah, no, definitely. I love that. I love that. Um, going back to when you were saying the, when you were, you saw yourself at Verb Forever, right? What do you think initiated that that gap? Like, what do you, what do you think caused like that separation between the culture that was being broken there? That you kind of said, you know what, this is not what I thought it was. I think it's time to go, or like I think it's time to do my own thing. What do you think made happen there? Like, was it like yeah. lack of communication or? That's a really good question. That's an amazing question. Um, I think what happened was some version of. FOMO or keeping up with the Joneses or something like that. So one of the things that I really loved working about working there, loved about working there when I first started was the people that owned it kind of had their own idea of how it was going to go. Like it was really unique and they, they didn't really look at a ton of outside inspiration. They're like we have an idea. This is what our truth is. And we're just going to play towards that. And it was kind of it was kind of like the wild west and I, I i loved it there i was like cool yeah let's do let's do things differently let's shake it up let's kind of create the industry that we want to see you know yeah. everyone's kind of doing this Let, let's go off on on this other journey over time it was a combination of success and lack of belief so year one two three passes and then all of a sudden, the company is starting to get a lot more press. People are really seeing it. Like, I remember the first the first year that we were there, I was starting to get really – I was getting pretty good at the whole barista competition thing, yeah. and I was in the zone. And so the year after I got there, I was like, let's, let's, like, amp up. Let's amp up the program and, like, 
really tear the roof off this thing. And we had two two baristas in the top six, which is the finalist in the whole United States. Like I got second in the nation that year. We did like really good at regionals. And then all of a sudden everybody in the industry is like paying attention to what's going on. Um, the branding looked really cool. It was it was really eye catching. So you had all these cool little little benchmarks of success. And then what I saw from where I was at was once you get to a certain level and know that people are looking at you, then there's all this pressure, most of it's self-imposed, but all this pressure to to perform in in a certain way. Like, okay, now we have four stores and we're this big. Now we got to do business the way that other people do business. Now we got to do whatever the big kids do. And there were all these other companies who kind of trailblaze specialty coffee. Um, Stumptown's one of them. Intelligentsia is one of them. Blue Bottle was one of like the OGs in the game. And it started to kind of pivot and be like, how do we be more like them? Because what we're doing now isn't good enough. Now all of a sudden we're playing in a different league. And that led to a bunch of different decisions being made. Um, Jared has a really, a really cool story that we tell in orientation where, you know, he was, again, like I said, the the first employee there. And during this time of expansion and growth and change in culture, one of the things that happened was they brought in a CEO. They were going to bring in the CEO from outside the company. And the idea was we're going to bring in the CEO. He's like a high level dude. He knows quote unquote business, you know, he's a business guy and he's going to do, he's going to take us to the mountaintop, you know, he's going to fucking be our Moses and part the Red Sea and we're going to walk through that whole thing with him. And Jared's like, cool, like what's up with this guy? And they're like, he's been living in Kenya for the past five or six years. He works in green coffee there. And Jared's like, okay, I get the desire to level up and, you know, just ratchet things up a notch. But the specialty coffee game's growing so fast. Like the cafe culture is evolving quicker than ever. I don't know if someone who has been gone outside the US for the last six years, who's been living in Africa, understands what's going on in the game and is gonna be able to take us there. And they're like, no, you're wrong. He's the guy. And Jared was like, here's what I'm thinking. We have had such huge success here doing what we do, doing those things that make us uniquely us. I think we can be the people to take us to the next level. Like, let me help lead this thing. And, you know, they kind of look at him and are like, you don't know how to do what we need to do. Like, it's cool that you want to help, but it's over your head, basically. And this is going to be the guy that does it. And it's just not you. Thanks for being here. Um, and so it's, it's that different cultural perspective. So, you know, you see people chasing these like ethereal things and the things that they quote unquote think need to happen for that to happen. Like Outside CEO, hire all these, you know, we hired a bunch of new people, people who understood retail, you know, we hired, and all of these people, like, so there's a guy that we hired, his name was Keithan. He actually works in the industry now. He, he works back in coffee. Super fucking cool dude. He had been running retail for like G-Star that does raw denim okay. and had a lot of success with that. And he gets thrown into this role where all of a sudden he's opening these new stores in LA for a retail coffee company and he knows absolutely nothing about coffee. And he's hitting us up being like, what's up with these fridge spec, like little dumb stuff, you know, what's up with this espresso machine? What's it? He's totally unprepared. And again, it's not a diss on him. Like he saw a cool opportunity for a cool job, took it and has no idea what he's doing. And meanwhile, you know, months prior, I'm at dinner with the with the owners being like, I want to be there in LA when we open LA. I'll move there. My wife worked there at the time, actually. She was the head of HR. I was like, Jenny's down to move. We'll go down to LA, help set everything up. And it was the same kind of thing. Like, ah, you're not a pro. We got to hire these pros. 
So that was how the culture just kept shifting to where it's like yeah. thinking that you need to do something to play with the big boys when you really don't. So almost they, they I'm guessing they grew almost too like really fast to the point where like, okay, we're growing at this rate. I feel like it's time to bring in like, I guess, random people that don't necessarily know what the culture is of the company. And they thought just because they have the title, they could come here and kind of run it without knowing technically how it's run. You right. think that's what c- kind of was like the misleading of like the whole communication connection with the company in I, itself? Or? Yeah, I think that I think it's the manifestation of fear and disbelief. Yeah, right? like, like just trying to bring in the right people for the big leagues, right? So be able to compete with other other ones instead of like focusing on what you have now and focusing about your people and who got you where you're at, right? Yeah, and I think there's, you know, there's always levels. Like, I don't have all the answers. Yeah, Jared doesn't have all the answers. We don't know everything, but what we did have was a really proven track record, which is every time we touch these things, they work out really, really well. And that model has some teeth to it. So let's try to take that as far as we can go. And within that, within within those processes, like let's say we were in charge of the whole expansion, we'd be making all kinds of mistakes for sure. Like there's no way around that. But I don't think we would have made as big of mistakes as got made by people who, one, didn't have the skills or knowledge of where we were at, and two, just didn't care as much. Like that is – it's hard to understate the value of someone who just believes in what you believe because at that time I was like, I'll do fucking anything for you guys. Like let me know I am down. And that is – there's power in that. There's so much potential. And we see that in our people too. Like our first employee is this dude named Tanner. And Tanner actually started working for us before we opened because he believed, he knew us from before and he believed the things that we were all about. And when we were, you know, like smashing up Portola, which was our original location, because we had to do a full remodel on it, he was there with a sledgehammer smashing out walls, hauling out drywall, breaking things down, hauling stuff to dumpsters. When we used to roast, and we didn't have a roaster, so we would drive to Santa Barbara to roast coffee and sell it because we had a little web store before we opened. He was like, I want to come. So he gets in the car with us, and the whole time we didn't have everything dialed in, so he's we like hand wrote all of our labels, like everything done by hand. So he's just for hours handwriting labels while we're roasting coffee. He's sticking labels on bags. He's like taking stuff to the post office and filling out invoices and all this stuff totally for free. We're like, we can't pay you. And he's like, I don't care. I just want to be a part of it. I'm down with you guys. And he's got his own skills and his own talents. And there's a lot of stuff that he doesn't know, but it doesn't even matter because I'm like, there's a dude who is so down that whatever he doesn't know, he's going to figure it out. And he is going to be way more productive than someone who knows a little bit or even a lot more but doesn't care that much. Because, I don't know, like, there's tons of people with skills, but are they ride or die? Are they really down with what you're you're about? Are they, like, the most insane cultural fit? And he is. So he can be anything we need him to be. And I trust that. And to me, that's more valuable than someone who's, like, a professional business whatever yeah that, that's honestly that's that's amazing that's crazy to see like that you at least yourself i don't know about jared but you guys were both down for like like verb in general to like hey if you want us to do this we could do this and they still kind of almost denied that right and it's like almost heartbreaking in a way but it's oh yeah like, and it's like when you have employees that strongly believe in the company and want to do what's best for it but then the owners don't listen to it is i can almost see how discouraging and 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 sad how one can feel you know and um connecting the dots back to all of that um i'm pretty sure you've learned a lot from that company right you learned on what to do or what not to do with the company you have now do you think it's helped you a lot oh, to for build sure. that relationship with your employees yeah absolutely yeah? totally i mean it it completely changed the way that I thought about work because work 
for for most of my life, like since I was a kid, what my parents told me, which was maybe good advice coming from the decade that they grew up in, which was like, if you go to work, you work hard, you get stuff done, you know, you shut up, you don't talk back, and you just you just do it, you know. Yeah. Don't make waves, just just plug on and and get it done. And that worked well for a while for like really basic jobs. But I mean, I mean, yeah, everything was informed by some level of empathy and feeling those things. And again, there's a disconnect between what we think is going to work and the reality. So it's really easy for us, even between the time of opening Cat and Cloud and now a few years later, you know, you don't know what you don't know. We're like opening up this thing. And we're like, yeah, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And it's going to be great. And like fucking rainbows are going to shoot out everybody's ass. And like yeah. everyone's going to be so happy. It's going to be awesome. And shortly after we open, we realize, wow, this one, it's way harder than it looks. Two, for people who really, really care a lot and knowing the things that we know, we still have a lot of work to do. Like we we have a ton of work to do to be the bosses that all of our employees deserve. So good work experience, bad work experience, medium work experience, like no matter what, like you're learning all the time. Like you could have the worst job ever. And as long as you don't let it kill you, you could be like, all right, I think I've got a handle on what not to do. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's great, man. Like, like my my Sergio and I, we um we obviously work in the people's business too, right? So we have to cater to the customers and make sure the customers' experience is good and make sure they have a good time and they want to come back. And I f I feel like the fact that we're in that business, we notice a lot when we go everywhere the way they treat us, you know. Oh, for and, sure. And I can tell you right now, your coffee shop is probably one of the best customer service that we had in a while. Like just for the simple fact that they go out of their way to tell us, oh, how's your day going? I for I forgot the, one of your employees came out to us and actually gave us a handshake and introduced herself and we introduced. Oh no way! Yeah, you know, and I'm like, what? Like that's cool. Like, you know, like and compared to like other coffee shops, like yeah, what do you want? Like okay, what's your name? And then that's it. You know, they actually took the time to get to know us. Um, we, you know, it's, it's honestly, is the culture that you're that you're you're providing and creating in your company is is phenomenal, and I I really look up to that. You know, because. It, that's hard to find. That's really hard to find anywhere you go nowadays, especially yeah. because people just don't enjoy what they do. And it looks like you or you and your partner created that environment or create that environment within your company to make people excited about what they do. Like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go to work, ask people how their days are going, and at the same time, make coffee and, you know, have a good day. Yeah, thank you. We're trying. I mean, props to the team. Like, they do all the, the heavy, heavy lifting, and it's – it's something that is, there's a huge disconnect between what the culture could be and what it is. And we, like our vision is a step further than what we're doing in our own stores. Like we really think that most businesses have the potential, like every business should be like this. Like we, sh like it sucks that we're special. Like we shouldn't really be special. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Like people are telling us how nice we are. And I'm like, that's rad. But why is it so weird for someone to be nice to you? Exactly. And there's all, all these systems and cultural expectations at play. But mo most people, whether they know it or not, are in the business of interacting with another individual, right? I mean, you cut hair. Yeah. And sure, you have, the, you have to have a basic level of competency. Like the skill needs to be there in the same way that we need to know how to roast coffee, make it, serve it. You know, if you get a latte, it's got to be on point. If you're drinking espresso, it's got to be delicious. But that's not really the game that you're in. You know, if, if you're a dick, like if you don't care about the people that come in, if there's a weird energy when people go to get their hair cut, like it really doesn't matter how good you are. People are like, exactly. yeah, I don't know. And it's pretty good, but like he makes me feel weird, so I yeah. don't want to go there. And that's and that's one of the things that of um, when I first started cutting hair too. Like I was so driven by like oh cutting hair, doing this and doing that, right? But I feel like as the time progressed and you, the culture kind of evolved, it was more into like this ego contest of like oh who could cut better hair, who has all this and who has this. So I kind of drifted away from like the whole area of like I I'm originally from the Bay Area, so like over there it's like a little bit more competition. And the fact that one of my um, close friends or barber homies that I went to barber school with, he ended up opening up the shop here in Santa Cruz. 
as soon as I saw that, I was like, wow, that was a gateway opportunity to a new world. You know, I know I never really been out there to Santa Cruz besides the beach and stuff. Right. It's like I'm 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 down for it. You know, I'm down to dive myself in there, like get to know new people, start fresh, start over. And you know, I took that chance and I started realizing, you know what, it's not even about the hair, cause it's not even about how good you could cut. It's about how you can make that person feel and how you could almost like in a way you're almost a therapist, you know, you for sure. You sit down, you get to know the the, the individual, you ask how their, their day is going and, and you know, just like how I met you, you know, it was yeah like random it's, acquaintance, you know, and it's just like, oh shit, you know? And here we are now, you know, and oh. and it's it's just crazy how things work when you you when you step outside of like making it about yourself and you make it about others. You go a step further and ask them, Hey, how's your day? Like you almost to a personal level, but not too personal, but like you make them feel like safe. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. yeah. And it's different for every person. Like yeah. the level that each person wants to interact on, it's, it's not all the same, you know, it's yeah. not one size fits all. Like we might have a different interaction than whoever comes into the chair yeah. after me, but having those, having those points of view are the things that are going to continue to set people apart. And if, if you generally, if you genuinely want to help people, I mean, that's something to really, really lean into because there are going to be people who are as good or better at you than whatever chosen craft you have. Right. Yeah. And it's like, um, back in the day when we did all the barista competition stuff, you know, everyone was doing all these latte art competitions and it was kind of like this exotic rare thing, you know, the, pictures that you do on them with the milk on the top of the coffee and now pff, you open up instagram and there's so many people who are just so good at it it's just insane like you're not you're not going to stand apart from yeah. that like maybe you get some followers and some social interaction with it but you're not really changing anyone's life unless you're like really leaning exactly. into what makes them them I, I love do you know about the barbershop club in la the barbershop club which have, one is that one is that the is that the I'm not remind me again? Who okay, it? this is one of my favorite businesses. So, barbershop club. It's in the. It's attached to the Hotel Normandy in Los Angeles, and it's a small two chair shop. And the dude that owns it, his name's Woody. He's I think he's from Kansas City. Uh, barbers in his family like generations back. Like his dad was a barber, his grandpa was a barber, and he has the shop and he operates the shop. And it's kind of like this one-stop shop for men's health. So aside from the barbers cutting in the chairs, they do monthly gatherings where they talk about different topics. Um, they're kind of like unpacking masculinity in a safe space. They have a tailor on staff. They have a uh, actual certified therapist on staff. So oh, you can go in and you're saying it's like therapy. Like you can actually book a therapist appointment That's at crazy. the barbershop and just kind of taking taking that um, that idea to the next level, which I think is really, really cool because dudes suck at talking about their feelings. No. <laughs> like, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. women are probably better at it than we are. We're, you know, guys for the most part, at least for me, I'm like, dude, I don't want anybody to think I'm weak. Yeah. Like, there's just like a little bit of like a machismo thing. Yeah. If, if you're just a dude, you're like, I'm projecting strength all the time and there's not a lot of places where we can go let down our guard and just kind of like be us, no strings attached. Like this is who we are and cool, cool. And like, don't get me wrong. The cuts that they do there, like the dude's an insane barber, but that's not why I tell people about his business every yeah, time. Like exactly. I meet someone who's like into hair or wanting this experience. I'm like, dude, he's looking out for the totality of, you know, whatever you are as an individual. I think it's super sick. Yeah, it's little things like that that set a lot of businesses apart, you know. It's just like the little small thing that does go a long, long way. Because I remember when I was in barber school, there was, um, uh, we're obviously uh, trying to get our license and stuff. And there were some people that don't know how to cut hair. Like, they, they didn't know how to cut hair, but they were there trying and trying to get better. And there was this one person that he did not know how to cut hair, but he he had the most people that would come back to him. And I was like, and I was observing him. I was like, why is it a lot of people go back to him, but he's not good at cutting hair? And then I started like kind of stepping away. I was like, okay, it's his interaction with the individual that makes all of them come back. Right. It's more of a one on one talk with him than the haircut itself. And it's like little things like that, that do make a huge, huge difference that people really don't think about, you know. There's so, I feel like we all are pretty selfish to like an extent to the point where it's like if we stop making it so much about ourselves and about other individuals, 
it, you almost feel a lot way better than if you make it a lot by yourself, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's crazy. I know? mean, there's so much joy you can get. Anybody who's ever helped someone out, it's it feels good to help someone out. No, definitely. You know, it feels really, really good. But And it's the same thing that happened at all these different places where you work. Like, the reason you can't help someone out or feel like you can't help someone out isn't because... I don't like people or I hate people. It's just like, dude, I'm having such a stressful time. Like, I don't feel really great about what's going on in my life. I'm angry for this reason, that reason, or the other. And it's easy to get in that spiral of like, dude, I can't even help myself. How am I going to help other people out? Like, I'm just trying to live. Like, I'm just, I'm trying to exist. And that is, that's like a whole other interesting subtopic of where, you know, we're in this place where, we have this privilege to be able to sit down and have this conversation. There's some people out there who can like barely make ends meet and like don't even have a job. And they're like, shit, you're talking about being fulfilled in your workplace. I'm trying to put dinner on my kid's table and I can barely do that. So have fun talking about your happy little times. Like I'm super stressed out, but I, I think like the trickle down from, from like changing the culture I think it could be huge because even someone who's just barely making it, like just because you work what most people perceive to be a crappy job, like why does it have to be crappy? Like maybe you're maybe you're a, a dishwasher in the back of like a grungy ass restaurant or something. Like why does that have to be a crappy job? Like you can run a restaurant and have it be like a great a great place to be. Like maybe yeah. you're not rich or whatever, but. Yeah. I don't know. I'm saying the same thing over and over again in a bunch no, of different no, ways. It, it, but it goes back to that stigma of like saying of like, how do I say it? You could be making a million dollars, but you're unhappy. Yeah. Why? Because I mean, you don't you don't enjoy what you do. Or you're not having fun with it. You know, like the money could be there or not, but at the end, it really does come back to your perception of how you see things. You know, like for sure. A, a lot of like, um, are, do you keep up with Gary Vee at all? Um, I dive in every once bit. in a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, he talks about like how he has a lot of friends that are making all this money but are really unhappy, and then he has his other friends that are just making the minimum, right, the average yearly uh, uh, wage, and they're happy, you know. And it's like it's, it really does come back down to your perception of how do you see things and what do you want to go with things, you know. So, I mean, it's really what What do you think? What do you think about that? Like, uh, in terms of the correlation between money and happiness yeah. or mm, yeah great question i think for most people there needs to be it's not that black and white like you if you look at research and you look at studies studies show that like at a certain level increase increase income doesn't correlate with increased happiness but you need to get to a minimum place where you don't have to worry about money you yeah. know um if if you're living here, it's really expensive. You're a student and you have the most basic job and you can barely pay your rent to hear someone talk about money doesn't buy happiness. It's like, dude, go fuck yourself. I can't even pay my rent. You're, you're telling yeah. me about this stuff. Um, so I, I think it's um, I think it's a touchy a touchy subject, but I, I can tell you from my experience that where I'm at right now, like I'm able to pay rent. It feels good. We're not rich, but I'm cool. My wife has a good job. We're, we're in that zone. For me, what I look at is when we add locations or level things up to the business. And I can tell you that the size of the business has no bearing on how I feel about it. Like we start with one store, then we open two. And then I think on the third store, when we were opening the store in Aptos was when I started to hit me, like the store opened and I was like, it doesn't really make me feel like we're better. It doesn't really make me feel like we're doing anything differently. It's not because people are like, oh, you must be so psyched, three locations. And yeah, I'm excited that it opened, but it doesn't change how I, I don't feel like the business is more valuable now. I don't feel like it gives me more joy or energy. I get the most joy and energy out of the business when we operate it according to our principles and our values and the things that we set out to do in the first place. And I feel the worst about the business when we compromise those things in order to squeeze a little bit more money out of it or move something along a little bit faster. This year has been like a pretty challenging year for us because we did grow really quickly. We did two stores 
back to back. And it was one of those things that we thought we could pull off. And we kind of did in that stores are open. But the stress that we went through probably wasn't worth it. Actually, not even probably. It definitely wasn't worth it. It put us in a place of pressure monetarily where we don't have big money investment. Most of our stuff is funded through SBA loans. Okay. Um, so building out two back-to-back really took a lot of our cash position, took a really big hit because we're paying those loans down, trying to get that off the table so we don't have as much cash flexibility right now. But the bigger portion was to get people where you need them to be to do what we set out to do for us to be able to maintain those interactions like you were talking about earlier. It's hard. It takes a lot of training. And what we kind of did was, you know, you have a couple cafes that are opening. The people who run those cafes, the team leaders there, they're doing all their own hiring. They're doing all their own training. We have some some help with education. But you're basically taking a person from this brand new fledgling little employee and growing them into someone who can make someone's day and make epic coffee on the regular. You can't open a brand new store with all new people. That would feel weird. Yeah. So what you have to do when you open a new store is you take people from existing stores. So we opened Aptos and Aptos had to pull people from the two stores that were existing. And then immediately after Aptos going, got going, Swift Street opens. So we had to take more people from the other stores and even some people from Aptos who were already new people. So we basically diluted the whole employee pool. People weren't getting as much training as they deserve, but it puts a squeeze on the people who are running the stores. And it left them rightfully so feeling like, dude, I put all this time and energy into these people and now they're just gone. Like they're not even assets to my store anymore. And that is kind of hard to deal with. And we're like, damn, you're right. That actually sucks. That's super hard. So we're learning through that to go to a place where, you know, we need to involve more people in this in the decision making that happens in the company and not just decide things as we're this owner group figuring out where we're gonna go. Yeah. And then you can come along with us and we think you can hang. So so you'll do it. Um, kind of like running uh, things with your employees first before deciding to do anything, right? Totally, yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's an ego check, right? Because yeah. you feel like, cool, we've got a lot more experience. We've been in the game for longer. We, we know what's possible and not, but we really didn't, we didn't do what we set out to do, which is we didn't account for other people's feelings and how it would feel to have to maneuver that quickly, do that much training, find all these people super quickly. And that, even though we're opening new stores, that made me feel super bad. I was yeah. super bummed. So that was one of those examples to where like, cool, we're growing as a company, but it doesn't, f- it doesn't feel right. When, when do you say you're ready for like expansion or what kind of like, where's to the point where you're like, okay, I think we can open another store. Oh, you know what? Let's open another one. When does it, when, how does that happen? Is it's like when the money's right or like, or just, it's just getting the other stores are getting very populated and it's time to grow. Yeah. I mean, for us, I think it's gotta be twofold. Like you gotta have the money where it needs to be in that you gotta have a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like to build out that store and how it's going to affect the financials of the company as a whole. Um, if you're running an okay business, the money is not going to be the hardest part. I think the hardest part or the trigger is basically taking inventory from everybody who works for you and being like, hey, we're thinking about this. Where is everybody at? And that's where the fruit is because we might be thinking everything's everything's sick, like everything's running well. You know, you can look at a P&L and be like, this cafe is making this much money. This cafe is making that much money. It looks like we're flushed with finances, but – the p l doesn't have feelings. It doesn't tell you how people in the stores feel. So I would, I think it's as easy and as simple as like checking in. And then when there is, it doesn't have to be 100% consensus, but maybe you're in that 80-20 zone to where most of the people in upper leadership in the company are feeling like, yeah, I feel like we're 
equipped, like mentally to do this thing. Like I have the bandwidth to do it. Cause honestly, we're doing a lot of brain work. We're figuring it out. We're figuring out how to get the money in. We're figuring out where the space needs to be. We're facilitating that whole thing. We're, we're setting up the structure and offering guidance, but the hardest work is done by the people who are supporting us. So asking the people like what it's going to, what it's going to be like for them. That's like the only way that, you know, that's probably something that I admire about your company is the fact that you guys take your employees into consideration a lot. You know, like I, I know you, you say you have weekly meetings, right? With your, your um, store leaders and stuff like that. Yeah. So we have weekly meet. There's four employee, like equity owners that own like a percent of the company. Aside from us, we meet with them every Tuesday they meet with the team leaders every week. And then once a month, we have the big meeting, which is like all the team leaders and all the employee owners. See, I think that's very, very important because a lot of, uh, I know a lot of companies don't do that. And um, I feel like that, that that creates that whole lack of communication, right? Like no one's on, on the same page. There's a whole disconnect. People are, some people are finding about this, others are not. It, it, when you make everyone involved and everyone almost on the same page, it just creates that, that, that good culture of, oh, damn, like, I, I'm important, you know, I feel good. Like, they're keeping me in tune with everything that's going on. Like, I feel like that's really good. Yeah. Um, what kind of, how did you come up with your principles for your company or, like, what inspired your principles or, or like? Mm, right. It was mostly, mostly prior workplace experiences, some of that, um, feeling how, how do we feel when we were at our lowest lows and how can we build a world that like tries to make that not happen for, for other people. So, I mean, before we, before we opened, we, we spent a bunch of time figuring out like, okay, cool. What, what, what's our, what's our mission statement? How does it sound? How does it, how does it feel like, how, how is this, how are we articulating this culture that we're trying to create? You know, what, what is our, what is our vision? Because people, I, I think that people need to feel like they're playing towards something that's bigger than themselves and bigger than, than like just even me or my, my business partners, like coming to work for me, it's not that cool. Like I'm just like a regular ass dude. Right. Um, but if you're coming to work for something that you believe in, so, I mean, we just had brainstorming session after brainstorming session. We went on camping trips and just spent all night talking about, you know, how do we set up a system that will help guide us through hard decisions that you're, that we're going to have to make in a way that feels good culturally. And I think you, you really, you really have to be honest about the things that you care about. Like it's really easy to create a generic mission statement that doesn't have anything to do with you personally. Yeah. Um, so it's just like really, really honoring whatever your sense of self is and being cool with it. If like, man, it sounds like something I've never heard. Like, I, like, I don't know what it means. It doesn't sound like a regular business thing. Um, just being true to yourself in that zone. That's, that's pretty sick. Are you ever scared that you're going to grow too fast and, and kind of break that culture? I already know that we've done it already. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said, this last year, like we definitely did it. We grew true. We grew too fast. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like I'll, I will eat that one. And like the other ownership, like Jared and Charles, like my partners, we will, we'll eat that together. And we don't really make any bones about it. We like freely admit it. Like, Hey, we are sorry. And we've said so in so many words, like, and I think that's important. Like when you when you fuck up, you have to own it and yeah. you have to apologize for it. And and culture has suffered in the interim. And thankfully, I don't think it ever reached the point where guests in the cafe could feel it. I yeah. think we put a lot of stress on upper leadership. And if we continued down that path of super aggressive growth at all costs, it for sure would have gone like the same way that we saw other things go yeah. in the past. Now I actually feel better about it than ever because in the beginning, you know, in the beginning you start with an ideal. This is my perfect picture of the world. You don't know what it takes to make that happen. 
you just believe. And like believe is one of our core values. Like if you don't have that belief that something can happen, you're never going to do it. Good luck like wading through all the challenges. So we had this belief, but we didn't have any practicals. You know, we started going, some things started working, and then you're kind of experimenting with what worked. And this year was honestly pretty, it was a pretty big low for us on the ownership squad. And we really had to suck it up. But through that low, again, is more learning experiences where people who are working for us don't really, it's, it's not, or at least from what I've heard, and I'm still kind of touching base with people to, to gather more information, but they're kind of on the same page as me to where it's like, it doesn't really feel cool to just add places for the sake of adding places. Yeah. Like, it, it, the number one motivation for coming to work isn't getting to work for this cool company that has four or five or 10 or 15 or however many stores. That's not what's inspiring um, workplace happiness. It's feeling like you're listened to people, feeling like people care about you. And it's been a huge like refocusing on it. So yeah, I was scared about it. We messed up. And now I don't have any, there's no doubt in my mind that we can do the right thing, even if it means slower growth. But it's like, it is, it's not easy because, I mean, it's easy to be the best version of yourself when things are going well. Yeah. It's hard to make the tough call when things aren't going well. Like that's, that's when you figure out who you really are. Like, and the same thing in, in your personal life, like everybody has values as an individual, like some people are more in tune with them than others, but as a human, like you have a code for how you live your life. You're like, I am someone who does these things, or I am someone who doesn't do these things. And there are times in your life where, you know, you may come to odds with some of those things. And it's like, it, dude, I don't even, I don't even know. I don't, I don't have an example. Like, um, okay. I'm married. I'm a faithful person. I'm the kind of person that doesn't cheat on my wife. Super, super chill, easy on the day to day. It's maybe harder if you've been having like a really rough time in your marriage and then you're out partying with a group of people and there's someone else there and, like it would just be really easy. And like, that's when you find out who you are and business is the same business is the same way. And yeah. people act like, well, you can't really have, you can't have that much conviction in business because at the end of the day, like money is telling you where you need to go. That's, I agree with that. It's, I've, I've been in a couple of barbershops and I've, been, I've seen it happen so many times where it's like, okay, the owner's in a tight situation or this is going down and at the end they kind of display their true colors and, you know, and it's like, wow, like, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking. But I feel like if you could really, like, get to that point and still be true to what you believe, your core values and everything, then I feel like the company itself or whatever you're working at is really going to... I think it's the way. And, it, yeah. and if if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work yeah. out. But if it if it... If you're not... To, like, if you're not doing it for the culture, if you're not doing what you believe in, like, it doesn't really matter anyway. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is when we go back and look at the numbers, like, to me, the numbers are an indicator of how well the culture is. Yeah. When we are, we are, we have been over the past four years, we've been the most profitable when we're not paying attention to the numbers at all. When we're really diving into cultural things, that's when the PL looks the best. And when we start focusing on the PL and what the numbers look like, that's when the culture suffers. And then for some reason, the PL actually starts to look worse too. That's crazy, huh? The, yeah. How that works. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of a trip and it, yeah, it's, it's weird. You know, you can't just money's not easy to make, you know, but there's people who are like, okay, we're going to look at the PL and then figure out like what levers that we can pull to just like make some more money. It's like business doesn't work like that. You can't exactly. just fucking push a magic button and all of a sudden make more money. Like if it was that easy, then everybody would be doing it and everybody would have a business. It's, it's understanding what, like what is driving that money? So for example, we, we could take a look at a cafe and say, 
the numbers are down in the cafe. And then you could have the discussion about, cool, how do we get the numbers back up in the cafe? And starting, starting from that point, put you in a certain mindset. So let's say, let's say our average tickets, let, I'm just making up numbers here. Let's say we do 400 tickets a day and now tickets are down to 350. And now we gotta get, we gotta get tickets back up to 450. How do we either increase the average ticket or get more people in the doors? People start spinning down these roads. They're like, well, I don't know, we could do this, that, and the other. But the approach is, is totally wrong because it's not like tickets or people or money live in this vacuum. So a better way to approach the problem would be maybe how, what are some things that we can do to increase the guest experience in the cafe? How can we make feeling like, com- how can we make coming into the cafe feel better? And when you look at what might be causing that dip in tickets, it's not just like people started to not come because they didn't want to come. Maybe it's because we got an influx of new employees that weren't trained well enough. Maybe it's because your cafe is a little dirtier than it should have been. Maybe it's because um, just things aren't as as dialed in. Maybe there's been some speed of service thing. So you're not going to fix the numbers by looking at the numbers. You fix the numbers by looking at the culture. Like how do you improve it for the people who are using it? Starting there. And then when you're thinking in, in those terms, you're like, you, you know what to do. Yeah. That's just that, it's crazy how that works. And, like, I've seen it firsthand, too. Like, I've, I've been in, like, a couple of barbershops, and I've always seen it, like, just crumble down because they lose that that initial culture that they established in the beginning because either they get a little too popular or they're just – they get over their heads about how things should be done, and, and it just it breaks and it crumbles, you know? Right. To tie it back together, it's like, oh, let's say, how do I get more people in to get faded? It's not cut hair better. Yeah. It's, like, create a – place that people want to be, exactly. you know, and it's like, once you have that, it's cool because people want to tell other people about stuff that they think yeah. is cool. Right. No, that's like, dude, you got to go here. You got to check these guys out. This is dope. And that's, that's killer. Did you, uh, do you have any mentors right now or like, or did you, or who is someone that you Man. right now look up to and you're like, Oh, I get a lot of insight from this person to make me a better person. I think I'm kind of missing that right now. You're missing that right Honestly. Now? Yeah. I mean, r- reading, all the time like if i had i don't have that in person mentor if i had to pick someone whose work really resonates with me i think simon sinek's work is Mm -hmm. really tugging at my heartstrings right now because he i mean he spends most of his time talking about what's like what the workplace could be you know like being the bosses that we all deserve being the bosses that we all wish we could have and i i the way he articulates the stuff that he says in his writing is amazing. So I, I do that a lot, but it would be cool to have someone in person that I connect with on a regular basis. That, that, you never like decided to go outside and kind of like venture on your own, kind of ask someone, like, hey, do you mind mentoring me? I don't know. I've, I, haven't, I haven't met anyone yet who I've had that kind of relationship with. Most of my, like I have a weird eclectic group of friends. Like I have a couple friends who own different businesses. So we're all, we're kind of sharing things and I'm generally curious. So always asking people, but I don't know, mentorship to me, it seems like a really, really personal thing. And I I don't think I've found that person who feels like completely right yet. I feel like they come, you know, they come, they come when the time is right. So I'll put it out in the, in the universe. Universe. Always speaks. It's out there. (laughs) Yeah. Holler at me. Um, you got to tie this down and close this down. Like what, what's something that you – or where do you see yourself in five years from now? No idea. No idea? I have no idea. I – um, no clue. Yeah. Where, where, where do you um, – or at least for the company, where do you – do Do you ever see the company um, – or has anyone even asked you for any money for the company, like a big corporation or anything? Like, oh, do you plan on selling this company? Uh, some people have poked in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, like, nope. But we were like, yeah, I don't know. it doesn't seem right. Like, uh, it's we've got a long way to go. Like, so the company is a is a vehicle. It's a vehicle for the ideas, and that's why when we're talking five year plan or three year plan, we have no idea because I have such an open mind for what we could do with these vehicles and where they could take us. So right now, the 
the coffee shop environment, the cafes are a huge part of what we do because it's something we're really passionate about. We're really comfortable with it. And if you have a big idea, it's cool to jump off in a place where you feel like you're totally competent. Like we feel like we can totally own that space and provide something awesome for people. But again, the real dream is to create this world where more businesses operate like that. So I don't know if that looks like more you know, connecting with other people and doing some speaking or doing some, I hate the word consulting because it sounds super corny, but yeah. like I would love to be someone who takes the lessons that I've learned yeah. and help them apply that to their business. Whether it's, you know, right now we do that with the people that we sell coffee to on a, on a certain level, but I, w- I, I think some of these lessons are so universally applicable that I would love to help people who are thinking of starting this project or that project or this business and that business and just figuring out a way to help them out. Have you ever thought about like writing a book on these lessons? I'm like every day, dude. Every day, dude, I would definitely pick that the up. The thing that keeps stopping me from doing it is I'm just, and I know this is like a flawed state of mind, but like every day, I'm just like, damn. This week, I know so much more than I did last week. Like ju- literally two days ago, I was rereading ten chapters that I'd started to write probably nine months ago Mm -hmm. and hadn't written anything on in like three months. I was like, shit, I would almost have to start this whole thing all, all over. But yeah, I I do want to do that. And I think, I think sharing what you've learned is super important. And it is, it is as a company, we're kind of on that track and that's why it's so open to where it's like, how do we make, how do we make this culture better? Um, Other things that I think about are, People come through our doors Mm -hmm. and because of the way our company is structured right now, a lot of our positions are entry level positions and a lot of people aren't going to climb that corporate ladder, so to speak. Like the bulk of the people that interact with our company aren't going to someday be team leaders in the company. Um, And I think that's great because we hire a bunch of people who are go-getters in their own right. They have these big dreams of their own. And I think they should go get them. And I would be super passionate about having some sort of jump off program. Like as someone who owns a business and has different contacts, I would love to help people who come through our doors, like getting those people placed in areas of like, you know, if I know someone who knows someone who can like open a door for them or pull strings for them, almost kind of like when you go to college, yeah. there's this group of counselors that kind of, they're placement counselors. They help you find a job outside yeah. of school. Like I would love to have this cat and cloud graduation program yeah, where it's be, like, you're trying to move on. You're going to work in film. Cool. Like I know this dude and this girl and like, let's put this together and see if we can't make something happen. Because when you're trying to push through those doors, like any little bit helps and like, I don't fucking care if you work for us or not. Like, if you work for us for a year and then go and do your thing, dude, cool. Like, how can we make your life better? How can we help? Like, somebody fucking, like, help. So if anybody wants to help me, then go ahead and help me. But I want to help other people. Dude, I I admire that a lot about you is the fact that you do put uh, the people first. And those principles that you create in your company, uh, they speak for themselves and they're very successful. You know, they speak for themselves, like I said. And... Dude, definitely write that book, man. I, I, I appreciate I will, that. I, I, will, yeah. I will pick it up. And it's little things like that that go a long way. Is like when you share like little golden nuggets and people take it to another level. And it's like, oh, where'd you learn that from? Oh, I learned that from this company, or I learned that from him, or I learned that from this person. You know, and it definitely changes the whole route of their life and how things go. And uh, I'm I'm excited to see how far your company will go. And Hell yeah! To see. You know, I'm honored to have you here too and really humbling experience to be here and be able to share these moments with you. And Dude, thank you. Dude, yeah, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm pumped. I'm, I'm glad to have you here, dude. Um, but yeah, any, any last words that you would like to share or any ins- words of inspiration that you would like to give to anybody that might be listening to this and be like, like damn. You know? Dang, dude, I don't, I don't know. We'll just end it with your biggest asset is you. Like that one thing that makes you uniquely you sometimes it's hard to bring it out but that is that is the way like don't lose yourself on the journey to be what you think you need to be like whatever you need to do what you need to do it's like buried somewhere inside you and like the best version that you're going to be it's like not conforming to whatever this book says or this podcast says or that guy says or this girl says it's like there's something in you that makes you 
unique and people can say that it's like, oh, like woo woo mumbo jumbo stuff. Like I 100% be- believe in that. So just don't lose yourself on the journey because it's easy to do. Oh yeah, man. Thank you, Chris. Thank you again for being on the show and hopefully I can have you back later. Let's do it. The line. We'll but, bring everybody. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah man. I'll be, I'll be sick. But yeah, thank you, man. Dope. Appreciate it. Sick. sick. Oh yeah. That was fun. Nice, dude. Hell yeah. Dude.